Naila wants to speak to folks once because she was getting a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails and thought it was best if she were to just address people's questions and provide her thoughts so then the family can get clear to move on with Jahai's services uh, and to get on with their, their healing as much as they can. So did you want to make a statement uh, first? <coughs> you can <do> <laughs> um, Yeah, I'm, I'm very heartbroken over um, my daughter passing. But I'm very proud of her because she defied all the odds. When they said Jahai would only last for two weeks, Jahai lived four and a half years. Jahai was able to communicate with me with her hands, sometimes her feet, sometimes her head, but we spoke with her hands. And um, I'm really gonna like miss her. I miss her already. Cause um, I gave up everything for, for Jahai and I have no regrets, not one. The only regret I ever had was bringing her to the hospital to get her tonsils removed. That's the only regret I'll ever have. Everything that I did from selling my house to quitting my job to moving across the country, um, giving up all the time I gave up with my family, it was all worth it. Because my daughter showed me that what I knew from the start, she was always alive. And I really feel bad that she had to die 2,558 miles away from all her family and friends who love her. If Jahai was gonna pass, she should have passed in California with her siblings, her friends, my mother, my brother, my sister, everybody around her. Of course she passed with me and my husband and my aunt, and we love her, but it's nothing like having your whole family and everybody. She should have not died in New Jersey. And I really feel like my daughter would have lived even longer if I had her here in California, because she would have had so much love, so much support. All her friends would have been able to come over and. I just really, um, I thank the state of New Jersey and I really wish more states would be more passionate like them and adopt the same laws that they have where you can keep your family alive and let it be your choice and not get forced to kill your relatives. Um, Jaha is just amazing. I just, I love her to death. Um, I just really feel like she, she showed people things that they didn't think that she was. I'm just very proud to be her mama. I really, really am, and I, I miss my daughter already. I don't know what my life is gonna be like anymore, because everything I did revolved around Jaha. From morning to night, everything I did. So right now, I'm just kinda lost. Like, I, I wanna paint her nails, and I wanna comb her hair and brush her teeth, and talk to her and play music for her, and, um, watch TV with her and let her know what's on TV and it's like, I can't do that no more and I don't, I really don't know what to do because 24 hours a day was dedicated to Jai. And um, I just really wish that, that my daughter didn't have to die in, in New Jersey. I really wish we could have been here. I don't, I don't wish she could have died at all, but it's, it was very, um, I got really lonely at times. And I should not have been had to been isolated away from my family and my friends to keep my daughter alive. That should have not had to happen. It was the times where just depression would really just take over. And you know, the only thing I could do was call home and 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 just talk to people. Um, I don't know if my life will ever be the same, but um, I know everything's for a reason. And I really just I met some really good people throughout this whole. Thing, people that I know I'll be friends with forever. Um, doctors that were really compassionate towards Jahai. Um, I learned that all medical professionals are not bad people. It's something that really, they believed in her just as much as I did. And they knew that she was alive too. Um, and they treated her like a human being. They fed her, <laughs> they gave her medicine, they operated on her. All the things that I asked for in the state of California that I didn't get, they gave to Jahai in New Jersey. So I really wanna thank the state of New Jersey. I want to thank all the hospitals that accepted her there, every nurse that took care of her there, because um, the nurses were really compassionate to her there. They loved her. Um, and I just want to thank my family for all the support they gave, my legal team, 
and especially my children who understood that I never left them. I was really just trying to preserve and save their sister's life. And I took four and a half years of time away from my children and they still loved me and they never had an issue with it. And they told me they have no regrets about what I did. They were proud of me. And I have to thank my husband because without my husband, I would have never been able to make it in New Jersey alone. This journey that I took, I don't know how many people could have took, did what we did. Coming from Oakland, California, getting dropped off in the state of New Jersey in the middle of a snowstorm where you know nothing about snow, you know nothing about power outages, you know nothing about where you're going. We didn't have nowhere to live, no car, no nothing. And we made it. And um, Jahai was my motivation behind that. So. Um, what would you tell people about the, the last day and the moments that you were with her? Because I know that was very significant for you. It, it was because um, the last day that I was with Jahai was um, on the 22nd, and she was getting ready to have another surgery, and she looked kind of sick to me. She didn't have that same look that she always had that I looked for. And so I spoke with her and I said, Jai, if you're ready to go and you're tired, you don't have to do this for me. I said, I said, you have my permission. You can go. I said, my husband will see about me. Your siblings will see about me. Don't worry. I said, but don't stay for me. I said, if you're tired, you have my permission. You can go. And Jai died a few hours later. And she died on her own without being removed forcefully off her ventilator. She still died while on her ventilator. So that's why I always tell people, you can still die on a ventilator. There's not a machine in the world that can keep you alive. If God wants you, he will come get you. I've been saying that since day one. And so that's what she chose to do. I guess she just wanted to make sure that I was gonna be all right. And so I have to be, because I promised her that I was gonna be all right, and I don't wanna lie to her. It's gonna be hard without her. She's a sweet girl. I watched her grow from the age of, from, from when I got to Jersey, she was only 13 years old, and I watched her become 17 and a half, and she grew taller, and her features started to change, and she went into puberty and everything, and I know for sure dead people don't do that. My child was never dead. She was always alive, and I thank God that the state of New Jersey realized that, and that's why she has a whole other death certificate with a whole different cause of death for June 22nd, 2018, because my daughter never died in December of 2013. She never did. There's no way in the world that I would be holding on to a corpse for four and a half years. That was a living human being. Her heart still beat. She still communicated. And I'm just amazed by her. And I, I thank God for giving her to me. And I thank God for that extra four and a half years that I had with her. Because I wouldn't have had that four and a half years had I listened to the hospital. Doctors don't know everything. They don't. They're humans, just like me and you. And when it came down to Jahai McMath, I sat at the table with people with so many degrees, the top this, the top that, and guess what? None of them knew more about her than me. Not one. I was smarter than all of them when it came to her. So I just have to tell everybody, stop pulling the plug on your people. Stop. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what race you are. <laughs> Stop letting the doctors tell you to prematurely disconnect your family members. Because how would we have known Jahai would have lived four and a half years? How would I would have known she would have started having cycles? How would I would have known she would have started going pubic hair? How would I have known she could respond to me had I killed her? Because that's what that was. They tried to make me murder my daughter, and I didn't. And I'm just asking everybody, before you ever consider pulling the plug on your family, take the time to see because they don't want to give you time. 72 hours is what they gave me. But I wasn't going for it. Do not let the hospital bully you. I sat at the table with people. They sit you, they sit all these people around you and they stare down at you and try to make you feel like you're stupid. I'm not stupid. I'm very intelligent. They try to say that my lawyer is using me and that I'm stupid. No, he do what I tell him to do. He works for me. <laughs> if anybody got used here. <laughs> He never charged me a dime, neither. Not once. I told him when I first met him, I don't have no money. <laughs> and he said, I will not charge you. And he did it out the kindness of his heart. And I pray that more lawyers can do what Chris Dolan does because 
not only was he my lawyer, we, we friends, and we be friends for life, and he loved my daughter, and he's a parent, so anybody that's a parent should have the heart to say, like, I'm not going to kill my kid. And I got talked about really bad because I didn't want my daughter to die. I mean, I got death threats, emails, all in the media. People just talked about me, talked about Jahai. And she was a 13-year-old girl, and they talked really bad about her. And I'm still her mother, so that hurt to read all this negativity about my child. Somebody said I fed her a hamburger after surgery. Jahai was still in the ICU. You could not get food in the ICU. It was just so much stuff that I read, and I just learned now, just don't believe everything you read. But the um, only thing I can say is that I'm very grateful for the extra four and a half years that I got with my daughter, and I'm so happy that I did not pull a plug on her. No regrets at all. So, Naila, one of the things I know that when we were together over all these years, when you saw in the, the paper about this young boy in England, Charlie Gard, who was sick and the world's response to him, that had an impact on you. Do you, would you tell people how that impacted you? It had an impact on me because, um, of course, I did not want Charlie Gard to get prematurely disconnected from that ventilator. I really prayed for that baby. But what puzzled me was, is I seen the president reach out to his people, the pope. Everybody opened their arms and wanted him and wanted to help him. But when it came to Jahai, nobody wanted to help her. And I just really don't understand it. Why didn't you want to help Jahai McMahon? But you would, I, when I seen the president and the Pope reach out to him, I was just like, wow, this is crazy. I don't know if my child wasn't the right color, but I really wish I would have got that response. Thank God that New Jersey, a hospital in New Jersey, reached out to me and said, bring her. But you have to understand, even when I brought her to that hospital, not everybody in that hospital was happy that she was there. And they let us know it, too. Trust me, they, they let us know it. A lot of people thought when we got up to New Jersey, it was just perfect and great. No, you still had to deal with doctors that felt like we don't want to take care of her neither. So I, I really wish that I, everybody, every race could get that same help that they were offering to Charlie Gard. I really wish all kids that could get in this situation again, whether they're black, white, Asian, Hispanic, doesn't matter. I hope everybody reaches out to them the same way and offer them the help. No mother should have to go through what I went through. None. Can you tell people about how you feel about the folks who sent you prayers and the letters and the cards and what you did with all those things? Um, everybody who sent letters and, and prayed for Jahai, we took all her cards and we had put them on her wall. She got so many cards on the wall that her room was like dark because that's how many cards was on her wall. We read every last one and I want to thank everybody for praying for my child because it was not medicine alone that saved Jahai. It was not that ventilator alone that saved Jahai. It was definitely God. But it was really prayers, and that's what kept me going, too. Because it was days where I didn't, I didn't even want to live. I really didn't, but I knew I had people praying for me, especially my mother. And this destroyed her as well. Because not only was she worried about Jahai, she was worried about me, and she was worried about my husband. So she, was, she had like triple worry on her. I only really had to worry about Jihad and care about myself. So I thank everybody for praying for us because on some really bad days, I would read good comments and, and read where people was praying for us and it would uplift me and make me want to live again. And, and one thing about Jihad is when I did feel like I didn't want to be here no more, I would say, how can you not want to be here and your daughter is fighting for her life every day? How could I want to leave? and Jahai fighting every day. And I would go in there and I would kiss her and say, we here another day, Jahai. We here another day. I did this for four and a half years. And I thank God for it, that four and a half years. And I really feel in my heart like it could have been more had I bought her home. And she was able to get like all the other things that other brain injury kids are able to get, like uh, hyperbaric oxygen and all these different things. Of course, Jahai didn't have the opportunity to do that. But um, I pray that when somebody else gets in her situation again, and they will, I pray that they get more opportunities and more chances to do things that I didn't get to do. I hope the fight that I put up opened the door to help other people. I really, I really hope it do. It always takes the one person to, to start it. And I know that they really didn't want Jahai to live. They didn't want her to beat the odds. But that little black girl from Oakland made history. 
And I'm so proud of her. She's beautiful. Even when she wasn't saying a word, Jahai really had the whole world stirred up without saying a word. She laid in the bed with her eyes closed in silence and had everybody talking about her in different parts of the country. That's powerful. Most people have to stand up and do what I'm doing to get hurt. Jahai got hurt with silence and not saying anything. My child is powerful. I thank God for her. Omari, did you have anything you wanted to say? You were involved so much during the fight for Jahai back in Oakland. What you want to talk about your experience or your feelings as to things went because you were so much a voice of the of the effort to keep her alive. Yeah. Yeah, stand for it. Uh, to begin with, I mean, honestly, we shouldn't have to fight. You shouldn't have to fight to keep someone alive, especially your own family member especially when she's been proven to be alive. You know, Jahai was alive and well when she went into Children's Hospital. She was alive and well when we took her out of there. You know, it wasn't until recently on June 22nd of 2018 where she finally passed. Um, the fight was hard, but I wouldn't take it back for a second. No regrets at all. I'm very, very proud of my sister. I'm proud of my entire family. I'm proud of Chris. I'm proud of Marv. I'm proud of everyone who came along the way and believed in us and believed that Jahai was alive. Everyone that was positive with positive comments and positive reach outs and positive letters, we all thank you. I thank the media for responding to my email in the desperate nights. I thank Chris for answering my phone call in the desperate night. You were crazy. I thought you were crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't think you were going to take my call. <laughs> I mean, you did take it. You said, I'm going to call you back. I said, oh, man, yeah, he's not going to call me back. But he did, and I'm thankful for that. I know that was God. I know that was meant to be. Just even how I got your number in the first place is miraculous and knew that was meant to be. And the way that the media came out to show support and this was able to get picked up and carry this thing, not across the nation, but also globally, and really had the whole world well, the majority of the world, I can't say everybody was positive in praying for Jahai, but there were people all across the world that were actually praying and sending in letters from other countries that we never thought would be possible. I've seen newspaper clippings of Jahai in other countries that I didn't know was possible. So I uh, just want to thank everyone who ever had any type of silent prayer, whether you said your prayer inside your home, whether you sent us something, whether you contributed in any type of way to this, we thank you. And again, I'm very, very proud of my family and my sister and Chris and how we put up this enormous fight that we never should have had to fight to begin with. And, you know, shame on California and thank God for states like New Jersey who have religious exemptions um, and allow you to have faith and keep your loved ones close to you um, without being pressured to disconnect them prematurely. So. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Marv, did you want to say anything? You've been living with this for the past four and a half years, and you're a part not only of the fight and the struggle, but the day-to-day -day of living with Jahai and Naila. You want to tell people what it was about or whatever you have in terms of your feelings? Well, it wasn't easy. <laughs> it ain't easy dealing with um, you know, having a wife that you love just going through depression and suffering on a daily, you know, not only just that, but having uh, health issues, heart problems, and, you know, <laughs> being in the snow with a six-speed car <laughs> trying to figure out how you're going to get to the hospital, and you, it, it wasn't nothing easy about it, you know. There's so many people to thank in the state of New Jersey, and, um, it just wasn't no easy thing. It wasn't an easy task. Um, I definitely got to thank my boss for my job because that man been patient and he gave me a chance that really helped me be able to take care of my family here and my family back in California. You know, I'm really thankful for him and um, thankful for our, the family support. Uh, we had to leave everything behind. <laughs> I jumped off the airplane with some T-shirts. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't easy. 
and uh, you know, just to meet people who uh, treated us like they knew us was was it was a good thing and we had a lot of support in New Jersey good home care nurses and things like that um, and I'm thankful for them why don't you talk about the blizzards because people on the west coast don't understand but y'all yeah. may remember there Man. were massive blizzards that swept through the east coast the blizzards so talk about the blizzards All right. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that didn't like me because I had to pull the generator out <laughs> I don't know <laughs> off the balcony dragging it to, to chain it to a tree fire her up just to get her ventilator back running uh backup batteries suction machines like it was always a test during the winter time those were some of the most scariest times and it's like when winter time came it was like it was on me you know it was on me to uh make it happen and it, it definitely was the first time in my life that i had been in some snow so it was it was crazy. It was it was some something off a movie. It was really something off a movie. But you know, we made it happen. My wife, I seen her strength that she had, and that gave me strength. I seen the strength Jahai had, and that gave me strength. That girl was fighting. She wasn't giving up, and I knew she was alive because I seen how she was moving. I seen how she was kicking fingers moving her fingers and, 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 you know, she was fighting and she was in there and I just knew that being a man of the house, I was going to have to figure it out. And that's what I did every day. I figured it out and um, we made it through it. Um, I really uh, hate that we had to bring her home the way we brought her home. I had really high hopes at you know, getting this case overturned and getting her back home sooner so she could listen to her friends, you know, tell her how their life's been going and talk to her about the people they went to school with, you know, like everybody do with classmates and, you know, hear her family talk to her and things like that, you know. Um, I, I really don't like the fact that we had to go through that and I definitely learned that <laughs> ain't no state like California, but we need to fix this medical issue when it comes to that brain death. That need to be addressed. Like that need to be uh, a lot of, at the forefront of a lot of people's mind. They need to be more compassionate hospitals when people are having issues with their loved ones. I think they should uh, be a lot more softer and a lot more, you know, helpful to the families instead of shoving papers in their face in the same sense as telling them, sorry for your loss. Um, that's a big issue that I think needs to be addressed because you never know if it's going to happen to you. You never know if it's going to happen to you. I never in a million years would have thought it would happen to us, but you never know when it's going to happen. So that that's something a lot of people need to think about because that's the way the hospital dealt with us. And not just the hospital in California, because not everybody was on the same page. You got doctors that didn't want to touch it because of doctors in California, and you have some doctors that got a real good heart that was like, really, like, I don't care. I'm helping this girl, so, you know. Mark, why don't you tell them about the time that you lost the power and you had to keep to the eye alive bagging with the bag? Because that, um, that was some scary stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, we lost some power one time, and I was in the middle of trying to drag the generator out, and we had a nurse that was kind of, like, losing it because my wife was going crazy. And it was like, I'm trying to drag the generator out, but then I got to run back in the room to help her, help bag her run back in the room, try to get some structures, run back, drag it a little bit closer to the door, run back, see about that. It was it was definitely a difficult time, but yeah. you got to do what you got to do. You, you know, you get to, in some rough times, you'll get the strength. Sometimes I don't know how I did it, but you know, I always thank God, because I know my mama praying for me and pray for us out there as well, so. It wasn't easy, but you know, we got it done.
what were you told about the authorities when the blizzards came as to whether or not they'd be able to come and give you help? Oh, yes. Yeah. So far as the authorities come, they always said that we would be first on the list, but I've never seen them. We've been in quite a few storms, and I've never seen them. They come, like, after it's clear, after the snow cleared. They come after we basically got it under control, but they don't show up like they say they do. They make you feel good when they tell you just to see you can leave them alone, but they don't respond the way they can. I mean, it, they, everybody else is in panic. So when situations like that, it's like <laughs> whoever's in your house is in charge of your house. So even in an emergency, you're going to have to make some of the best decisions for your family because not everybody going to be able to rescue you, everybody. So, you know, it's like you got to take care of your own household, your own situation. Now, Eli, I just want you to address one more thing before we open it up. You've read in the comments where people said that you kept your daughter alive in order to make money or that you were doing this because you wanted to get money out of it or were using money that was donated for other things. And, and I know how that affected you, but I'd like you to tell all these people about the reality concerning that. Um, when it came down to money, money was never a thought. My child's life was is worth more than anything. Um, we, we were actually, this is probably actually the most brokest I've been in my life <laughs> because I had to stop working to take care of Jahai. Um, I had to sell my house, which was very heartbreaking because that was my first home I ever purchased. It was a home that I purchased for my children. I thought even when I bought another one, I'd still keep that one here to, for my children when I die. But um, money was never an issue. And, and I don't think people understand that we, <laughs> I was broke. <laughs> I worked in my job for almost 13 years straight. I've never been a person to have to ask people for anything. So that was, um, it was really hard when I would hear people say like, oh, they ain't spending money. And I'm like, what money? We don't, we don't even work. We don't even have a job. We looking for jobs. We looking for money. My poor mother exhausting her bank account, sending money down there to us. We having to ask family members for help. Me and my husband don't, we not those type of people. We don't, we like to have our own money and our own things. So there was never, no money involved. I'm, I'm telling you, this is probably the brokest we ever been. And New Jersey is expensive, very expensive. There is nothing cheap in, in New Jersey. So every everywhere we we lived, we we really just had to like budget and to to really like just get by until we finally learned to get established in in New Jersey. Because I was broke for for a long. I'm still broke. <laughs> there was never any money. I don't even know what what money could do for me right now. And my child is dead. It, would, it can't bring her back. She is gone. They could give me all the money in the world. It's not going to bring her back. Her life was worth more than, than any type of money. I don't, I don't know any mother that would choose money over their children, period. And I would have did this for all any one of my children. I have four children. I would have did it for them all. Because when it comes to my children, I don't play. I do not play behind my children. I would by any means necessary, I will preserve the life of my children. Now, one thing that's going to be asked of you, because it was asked before, is who paid for her medical care while she was in New Jersey? She had insurance. New Jersey provides insurance like they provide to any other child with a brain injury. They provided insurance for child. So she had insurance. Now, not everything was covered by insurance. So my husband had to pay for a lot of stuff out of pocket because insurance doesn't cover everything. But for the most part, she had insurance, and I really thank God for that because there's no way in the world we would have been able to take care of her and have 24-hour nursing and supplies delivered to the house. We would, we, there's no way that, that we'd be able to do that. So they treated her like the human being that she was and gave her the insurance that she deserved because my child was brain damaged, not brain dead, and there's a difference.